I'm going to be spending the next 20 or so minutes talking about software-defined networking. Um, software-defined networking is something we've all heard a lot about. We know it's important, but none of us know really why it's important. It's the new style of IT. Software-defined networking is going to help revolutionize how we go to market for server storage networking. Well, today I want to explore the many facets of this acronym SDM. I also want to go in and explain what competitors are um, aligning with what, which of those facets. And then finally, at the end of my presentation, um, I'm going to take some time and uh, give a little feedback of some of um, my experiences and takes on some of the activities we've done over the last six or eight weeks. So before I just dive into SDN, I want to just start with a little brief history of networking starting from the 70s and where we are today. So I'm going to be dealing purely right here, so you know, if y'all don't have to look at the, um, at the projector here. So starting in the 70s, we had this type of topology. This is called mainframe or remote terminal topology. These are not switches. This looks a lot like the network we have today. These are actually servers. And essentially, this is a mainframe, and these are hosts off your mainframe. <coughs> And all the communication that can take place here is that the host can talk to the mainframe. That's the most fundamental infantile network that's ever been. So this is literally where it started. And the mainframe could take some of that information and communicate it to other hosts. But this is not scalable at all because the mainframe is a central computing process. So anything that comes in here, it has to take time to process to send out. And it inundates the network, so to speak. So in the 80s, we came up with something called microcomputing, or point-to-point -point network. And it looks a lot like your circular topology. For those of you who are um, diving into networking books, I know you've seen this. And you might be like, when the heck did this ever be? A, when was this ever a standard? 1980s, microcomputing, point-to-point networks. So again, we're not in switches yet. These are still computers. So you have hosts that are speaking to hosts point-to-point. Um, clearly, this isn't scalable at all. Whenever you get to 10 hosts, if you want to go from, say, A to B, you have to hop between six or seven computers, or five or four, depending on how large the circle is. And so that isn't scalable. It's also extremely expensive. And again, you're using computational power to pass that information along. So the 90s gave us local area networks. Okay, this gives you your star and mesh topology that we all know and love so well. But why do I bring up the history of networking? Well, it's because nothing has changed since 1990 when it comes to networking. We've been utilizing the same topology using bridges, what they call it then, and we've now changed the name to switches. And the only evolution that's taken place is we've released more protocols and come up with faster connections. Um, so much of what the speeds and feeds that we've learned have just been an extension of this topology. This is not sustainable with the amount of IT that's coming out nowadays. With mobility devices, with cloud computing, so now instead of having server storage and networking on site, you're going to be hosting those off site and you have to bring all that information in through a network. So now the network's going to be inundated in ways that it's never been inundated before. So we came out with, or not we, but academia came out with something called SDM. And you may ask, what is SDM? Well, it depends on who you ask. If you go to university and ask what software-defined networking is, they're going to give you an answer. If you go to HP and a software-providing company, they're going to give you an answer. And if you go to a company like Juniper or Cisco, who has an invested interest in keeping switches like they are, they're going to have an answer. And I'm going to align those to the different definitions of SDM. So let's start with a virtual look at what a switch really looks like here. Whenever we came out with the topology that I just showed you in the local area network, we came out with a switch that has two planes. And this was real innovative at the time. So you have a control plane and a forwarding plane. Why are they called planes? Like, what well, aren't they in the same switch? Well, this is hardware. This exists on an application-specific integrated circuit, or an ASIC. So this is hardware or a small computer, a CPU, that's sitting inside the server. And its entire job in the forwarding plane is literally to do the action of pushing packets through the switch. 
The control plane is where all of our protocols sit. Your SNMPs, your OSPFs, the IRFs, all the things that we've heard about. So if you have a switch or a router here and a router here, the control plane is what's doing the communication with the other entities in the network to say, hey, that's the direction we're going to send it. We've all heard of routing tables, right? Routing tables sit in something called a router information base. It sits inside the control plane. Once the control plane identifies the direction and speed that it wants to take, the software communicates to a, another routing table that sits below it called the forwarding information base. Well, I bring that up because the RIB is much slower at executing than a FIB because the FIB sits on the hardware. So, as this sits, this is extremely expensive <laughs> because you have a lot of software and you have a lot of hardware sitting in the same uh, machine. If you did a network with just three of these switches, now I'm going to circle them as routers because we know routers and switches oftentimes do a lot of the same things. You have three FIBs, you have three RIBs, okay, but you also have three command line interfaces. You also have three security suites. You also have three proprietary. Um, you have three proprietary operating systems. And at the end of the day, this just simply isn't scalable for what we need. So HP took a dive into something called OpenFlow, and along with many other vendors, we came out with the first definition of SDN, and that's Open SDN. What we did with other vendors is we're taking out the control plane from that forwarding plane. So now the brain sits on a controller or a DL380 server and it from a central location hosts all the security, the programmability, the command line interfaces in addition to um, some other really neat features that I'm going to dive into. And the forwarding level does nothing more than four packets. What have we done here? We have commoditized switching to a inexpensive and scalable level. You all have heard of OpenFlow? OpenFlow is nothing more than an open source protocol that we use to separate those two entities. So oftentimes you'll hear a 5900 switch with OpenFlow capabilities. That means that it simply just has the ability to uh, run OpenFlow and separate those two planes. So that's a software defined networking um, capable switch. So, why would people jump to something like this? I mean, is it really ready for this? Well, the answer is yes. People in the old days, with, when you had your control plane and your form, you come on in. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think the door's just beeping, so I thought I'd ask. In the old days, when you had a switch with a control plane and a forwarding plane in the same uh, entity, you had proprietary software on there. So nowadays, customers want to have programmable protocols. They want to make up their own protocols in a way that they can make intelligent packet forwarding through their own networks, because each network is different. If you had a, even if you had an HP switch, if you wanted to do something specific to your business, you just simply couldn't. I mean, you could call HP and say, hey, can you throw that into the code? And we would say, oh, well, we love you and value you as a customer, but no, that's not going to happen. With this, you can, because this is, open, this is using something called open floodlight. An open floodlight is nothing more than the operating system, so to speak, that operates this controller and allows you to manage beneath it. Does anyone have any questions up until this point? Because I'm throwing a lot at you. All right, I'm going to continue. So running open floodlight using the open flow protocol, we've separated these two planes. And this is extremely scalable, programmable, and it's inexpensive. You're no longer having to pay Cisco $50,000 for switches that you can now just buy basic merchant silica. And what I mean by that is commoditize this and only have ASICs in it. So what exactly is Cisco and Juniper's answer to our solution? Well, they've taken a bit of a different path. And remember, they obviously have an invested interest in keeping which is a bit complicated. So they have SDM via APIs. APIs is simply just an acronym for Application Programmable Interface. And uh, it's just a way for you to run different applications and protocols on the switch. So Cisco says, well, 
we're going to take a lot of the same topology. We're going to have a controller, and we're going to have our little switches down here that will communicate with your controller. But instead of it being only a forwarding switch, having basic silicon, you have forwarding. You still have your control plane. And on top of all that, you have APIs. And for the sake of writing, we're not going to replicate that over the other two switches, but APIs exist on all of them. And so what this topology does is it uses the controller, still a server, to communicate with the switches. But the programmability that was taking place here, the, the security and the interesting um, features are taking place here and at the controller. Cisco has not simplified the network at all. They've just added more to it. This is not any less expensive, but to Cisco's credit, it is extremely programmable because now you can program at the switch and at the controller level. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. So to Cisco's credit, it is extremely programmable. And to their credit, you can remove some of the control layer of the switch and add it up to the DL380 or whatever server you're using, it is capable to remove some of that intelligence. And in their presentations, they oftentimes will say, well, we're removing the intelligence, we're, we're simplifying the network beneath. But in execution, evidence is showing that, that they're simply not, that it is still staying very similar to the topology they had before. And for that reason, um, we just don't see the simplification of the network that we're being promised through this offering. So, Again, this offering is not inexpensive. It is not simplified because you're still having management at this level and you have management at this level. And at the end of the day, it does have the benefit of high programmability. All right. So at this point, does anyone have any questions uh, between the two uh, comparisons? What's up? Uh, you said that Cisco's was extremely uh, programmable. And, but how is that? Is that um, extremely programmable compared to the way that HP is doing it? Well, it's programmable, both of them are extremely programmable, because now instead of routers making autonomous decisions for themselves, okay. like, uh, and they, by the way, these are routers or these are switches. So in the past, whenever you run RIP or OSPF, this router makes a decision to send to this router to make a decision to send to this router, and you have to hope the guy behind you made the right decision, right? And <laughs> at the controller level, it oversees the whole network. So it runs something called an open, uh, it runs something called a flow table. So when a packet hits this switch, it just forwards it to its default gateway, which in this case is your controller, and the controller runs its own flow table, something similar to our routing tables that we already know. And so now, if you want to get from here to here, you don't have to go to F, or excuse me, the next switch. It knows, oh, actually it just sends you around. So that's the programmability you get in our solution. How Cisco's differs slightly is that they're running extremely intelligent APIs at this level. So what they're able to do is give you an over architecture programmability, but also the ability to do that complicated forwarding on these superior APIs. And the superior API is again an application programmable interface. It's just something that allows to do complicated uh, protocol forwarding. So, we lack that in this topology because we pushed everything up. OpenFlow literally removes it. Um, and I'll get to Open Daylight now, kind of a nice segue, which is the operating system they use. Is that, is that a big advantage they have? Well, this is the advantage they have. And, and this is why um, Cisco's taking the market in SDN. I mean, naturally, Cisco owns the network, so this is a natural progression. But we use something called Open Floodlight, and I'm coming to you right after this. So Open Floodlight is our operating system. Um, the problem and limitation with Open Floodlight is you have to use Open Flow. You can't have Open Floodlight without Open Flow. The cool thing about it is it's scalable up to 2,000 switches and/or routers. And you might be thinking, holy, you know, how would you ever accommodate 2,000? Well, for large enterprise businesses, that's extremely easy. So with SCN via APIs, they use something Cisco or Juniper. They use Open Daylight. Open Daylight is a uh, Open Daylight uses proprietary protocols. We use OpenFlow. Anyone can use OpenFlow. It's open source. They use proprietary protocols, so um, it doesn't require OpenFlow. And for that reason, Cisco loves that because they don't want to commoditize their switches at all. They want to keep the intelligence at that level because they want to make sure they're able to charge you fifty, forty thousand dollars for top of rack switch. 
So in this environment, um, Open Daylight allows you not to have to run OpenFlow, but its caveat is it's only scalable to 200 switches. Now there are some ways to combine the networks once you have 200 switches. Um, you can then go in and, you know, with uh, management options, kind of similar to what we do in some of our uh, server options, is cluster them, so to speak. Um, but still, you are limited to that uh, to that switch number. Whereas you get 2,000s open daylight. Cisco and Juniper both adopted open daylight, and when Cisco owns 65% of the market, Ju Juniper owns 18%. When roughly 80% of your market adopts this technology, it then becomes like an industry standard. So that's a bit of the limitation. Is we are, HP is a bit on its own with open floodlight. We invested $40 million in them last year. And um, when we did, we kind of you know, sank our heels into the ground because we really believe that this is what's going to change networking. Um, and if you take the percentage that HP owns in the switching market, roughly 13, 14%, it's significantly less than when you consider where we're sitting in the software-defined networking market, over 20%. So we are doing better at SDN than we are at top of Rex, which is so, some encouraging words. The final, oh, and Eric, did you have any? Um, yeah, so would Cisco or Juniper, their system be faster since they have 